seriously increased your memory footprint given the size of data that you have. And there are multiple, it wouldn't be Oracle if we didn't give you choices. So you have multiple levels of compression you can play around with. I did a blog post that talked about uh, the highest level of compression versus the lowest level of compression and the trade-off in space versus performance. And so you can go look at that if you want. You can draw your own conclusions. You can try this on your own, own experimental data if you want, or you can actually set it up in a, in a real environment. You might want to talk to your... So if you do it with VirtualBox, no problem. Uh, if you actually in, put it in place in your production, or you're not production, but your development environment, you may need to talk to your licensing guys to make sure nobody comes and knocks on your door. But the bottom line is that, and that's because it runs everywhere. So uh, the, the, the real test, the true test, is to try it on your data. And then in addition to that, something we call in-memory storage indexes, something similar to what we do with uh, Exadata, but the fastest way to do something is to not do it at all. And so uh, in-memory storage indexes actually provide the ability with uh, where clause predicates to say, well, this, this area of memory that comprises the object we populated, we, we don't need to look at that because we know the value is outside that range. And so we can skip over IMCs. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up. So when you populate an object in the column store, it's not like con one contiguous segment. We're going we're gonna to divide it up into essentially extents or what we call in-memory compression units. Again, you can go to the blog, go to our white paper to read about what that is. But uh, an object will be made up of one or more of these IMCUs, and each of these IMCUs will have the columns associated with the rows that populated that IMCU. And we'll have these in-memory storage indexes for each of those columns. So as we're scanning down an object and going through each of the IMCUs, if we and we're we have a where clause predicate, we can actually skip over data that we know isn't going to be in that particular IMCU. In essence, if you're looking for, if you're doing a primary key lookup, typically you would say, well, we'll just go to the index, get the row ID, and access the table, and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be done. But with database and memory, you can also do that, and it's typically, typically the optimizer is going to pick a, a, an index access. But um, if you don't, if you do it within memory, we'll basically scan all of the IMCUs and we'll skip over everything, assuming your where clause predicates obviously on the primary key, uh, and then we'll only look, have to look at one IMCU to get that same amount of data. So it's pretty close, especially if you have to do an I.O. for the index block or the table block, because we're already in memory, because we're going to populate the entire object in memory. Uh, that's not something else I should bring up. So I, I, I've given you guys kind of the abbreviated version, and one of the other things I always mention is that database memory is not a cache, so it's a store. Unlike the buffer cache, where we're actually caching only a relatively small number of database blocks typically for the entire table, database memory populates the entire object in the column store. So we get that compression, you can exclude columns if you want, but the bottom line is we're going to populate the entire object. So when you scan, it's always in memory. And that's, again, the in-memory part. I'll make sure I get that point across. And then lastly, SIMD vector processing. Lots of other people do the same thing, but single instruction, multiple data. So all of a sudden, we can do think of array processing. We go from scanning millions of rows per second per core to billions of rows per second per core. It's just computer science. We can do uh, uh, 512 comparisons in one cycle or one instruction, if you will, as opposed to doing it one row by row processing. And so that gives us a significant, all these things together give, uh, give us that 10x or better performance increase in most cases. Not everything, and those no promises. Your mileage is definitely going to vary. Some queries will do better than others based on data distribution, data types, query complexity. But the bottom line is what I always shoot for is 10x. That's pretty realistic. In addition, the secret sauce of all this, the reason you can run your current applications when you've populated a bunch of tables in the column store and not have to say select from the row store or select from the column store is the optimizer, so the cost-based optimizer. So when you run a query, the optimizer is going to parse that query and create an execution plan. And so based on cost, it's going to decide, is that table in the column store or is it only in the row store? If it's only in the row store, are there indexes associated with it? Anyways, it's going to take the lowest cost plan and, we'll, and hopefully we'll see table access in memory full. So we'll do a column-based, a columnar-based access of that object. It's on an object-by-object -object basis. Am I already running out of time? Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Five minutes, all right, I'll try to speed up. Um, not only does, so not that cost decision, but that cost decision is affected by the three areas I talked about, scans, joins, group by aggregations. So the ideal database and memory query, uh, whether you have one table accessed or multiple tables, would be that all of the work is done in the column store scanning those objects. And so we've done a lot of work with pushing down uh, ag function aggregations like mins, maxes, sums into the actual scan of the data. Um, also, where cost filter predicates. So we can actually apply filter predicates and uh, function-based aggregations during the scan of the data. So we push that in, we call it pushing it, pushing it into the um, scan. You'll see that in an execution plan. Uh, Oracle will always provide, well not always, you can ask Oracle to provide you with an execution plan for running your SQL, and you can actually see that. In addition, there's statistics that will also tell you whether you took advantage of that. But rather than having to bring those column or row values back up into the uh, execution layer and throw away values, we can actually skip over them or eliminate them during the scan. You can't run a query any faster in Oracle than doing that, even Exadata. In memory is the fastest way you can run a query if you take advantage of, of database in memory. Um, in addition to that, joins. So hash joins can be turned into scan and filter operations with a where clause predicate will create bloom filters. And so rather than typically a hash join, you have a smaller table, larger table, but you have two tables, and one table will get scanned, will create a, in the PGA, will create a, a build table, a probe table, um, and we'll then scan the second table and, and see if we have matches to, to do the join. With database and memory, with uh, hash joins, we can create, if we can create bloom filters using filter predicates, we can actually push that join into the scan of the two tables so that we don't have to probe the, the hash table in the PGA to know whether we have a join or not. All we have to do is go to the hash table in the PGA to get the actual the materialize the column values we need to associate with the join after it's already taken place. I may, may or may not have confused you with that explanation. We did an Ask Tom session on that. It's an hour-long session, and we also have a blog. I have a blog post out there that explains that in excruciating detail if you want to actually, if you're interested in that. Um, and then, then uh, sorry, group by aggregations. So something we call in-memory aggregations. We actually created a new group by um, Oracle database traditionally had a sort group by and a hash group by. We added something called a vector group by. So there's an entire white paper associated with that. We do effectively the same join mechanism. We can do it during the scan and filter operation. In addition to that, we can do the group by aggregation in memory as we do the scan as well. So, uh, so the hash join can be up to 10x faster, and the in memory aggregation or vector group by can be up to 6 to 8x per times faster. So huge speed ups, leveraging these technologies with database and memory, and these are all optimizer choices. So the optimizer knows that the objects are in memory and can say, well, that makes sense to do uh, these operations. Um, and you can see this in execution plans. So that's, so together, the technology end of it, scanning the data, and then the, op uh, the optimizer ability to change the execution plans provides that huge speed up, and again, is why you don't have to change your application. Data changes real quick. Uh, DML always happens to the row store just as it does today. We, we mark the data as it's changed if the data is populated in the column store. We just basically mark it. We, we, we preserve the transaction architecture that Oracle has, so we keep track of the SCN, so we can always put together a read consistent view of the data. And then if the data is changed and a scan occurs, We'll scan the column store, any values that have, column values that have changed because some DML occurred, we'll go to the row store and pick up those changed column values. Uh, in the background, we'll eventually repopulate individual IMCUs that have changed, either based on reaching a threshold or just the fact that something's changed in the IMCU and we have additional <coughs> CPU resources. So all that happens in the background. Naturally, somebody's gonna ask, well, what does that do to my response time? And that's where this, thing I was talking about, this YouTube channel video that did, we worked with the, the Real World Performance team, did a actually quite large OLTP mixed workload system, ran it with and without database and memory, ran analytic reports. With analytic reports and sufficient CPU headroom, 
doesn't degrade OLTP processing at all. Without an, uh, uh, enough memory or without the data in the column store, you see this blue, we get I.O. and things kind of go into the tank. I'm waiting to get pulled here. Uh, so I'll go real quick, I'll just say, uh, again, since it's a part of Oracle Database, it works with everything Oracle Database has. Rack for scale out, uh, scale up, as large, much memory as you can stick in a database server, basically Oracle Database, as much data uh, memory as Oracle Database can address, which is way more than you can stick in a database server. Um, Multi-tenant, and uh, wherever the data lo is located, whether you put it in DRAM, whether you have it on flash, whether you have it in row store on disk, whether you have it in HCC on disk, wherever it's at, you don't have to figure it out, Oracle Database takes care of that. So you can truly run your applications unchanged with database and memory, which is a big selling point. And then we've done a bunch of additional work. The two areas where we're really working is performance. Since we're basically populating data in the column store, we're only using CPU to access memory. So the only way to speed that up is either reduce the CPU cycles or parallelize. We support parallel query, and we've also, also, we also support actually something called in-memory <coughs> dynamic scans, or the ability to dynamically parallelize uh, the scans, regardless of whether you use parallel query or not. Um, and then the other, the other issue that people will uh, typically say, well, since you don't have to put the entire databa or database in memory, how do I know which objects I should populate in the column store? So right now, it's kind of a hit or miss. You use the in-memory advisor. You look at your problem queries. You kind of figure it out. But we're working on something called automatic in-memory. We released it initially in 18C. That's going to do this using heat map heuristics. It's going to do it for you. So think of being automatically populating and evicting and repopulating new objects as they become hot, cold, they're used, they're not used. Um, and then, of course, you can control that with other issues or other aspects of the alter table command as well. So you can override it, if you will. Um, and then I kind of talked about exit data, active data guard, external tables. Maybe you have data, big data, and you want to combine it with some of your relational data and run those queries in Oracle against your existing tools. You can populate external tables directly in the column store without having to materialize them first in the database. So all those kind of things are what's changed in 12.2, 18C, 19C, soon to be 20C, since we're now on a yearly uh, cycle, upgrade cycle, so it just keeps going. And where can you get more information? I mentioned our blog. Uh, it's a little hard to navigate because it's an Oracle blog, so it's just <laughs> Oracle, always, <laughs> Oracle always makes it hard. So I, I put a little circle, you click on the menu, and there's a resources page. And in there, it has all the white papers, all the customer stories, videos, uh, Ask Tom sessions, uh, anything, hopefully anything you want, but if you don't find something you do want to know about, just email me and I'll try to point you in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you, and I appreciate it. And hopefully you find it well. Engineer here at Alexio. 
Um, today I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit uh, about the feeding data to the Kubernetes feeds, bringing data locality to your containerized big data workloads. Um, thank you for Grid Game for hosting us. This is our first in memory competing meetup. Uh, great turnout uh, here, so I'm very excited to be here. So, today we're going to be talking a little bit about what Luxio is, high level overview of Luxio, uh, overview of Kubernetes, uh, for those of you not familiar, and how Luxio and Kubernetes works together. Uh, then I'm going to be showing a demo uh, of Spark and Luxio running on Kubernetes in my local environment today. So Alexio overview. So a little bit of background about what the Alexio project is. Alexio started off as the Tachyon project at UC Berkeley's AMP Lab uh, by our then PhD student and now CTO, Horian Lee. Uh, we were, became an open source project established and the company was formed to commercialize Alexio in 2015. Uh, along the way, we've gotten some funding from Dries and Oritz and other VC firms with this goal of really being able to orchestrate data at memory speed for the cloud. No, no worries. Uh, especially for data-driven applications such as big data analytics, ML, and AI. Uh, we're incredibly proud of our fast-growing open source community. We have, <laughs> we have about over a thousand contributors, uh, over a thousand contributors, 4,000 plus stars on GitHub. Uh, we are Apache 2.0 license, and if you want to join the community today, you can do that on our Alexio community Slack channel, or you can check out our repo at github.com, Alexio. All right, so just a little bit of background of what we saw in the data ecosystem and where Alexio kind of came about to solve this problem was about 10 or 15 years ago, we saw the advent of what we call the data ecosystem beta. And so with the introduction of things like MapReduce and Hadoop, people started moving a little bit away from traditional RGBMSs and into what we called this co-located storage and compute paradigm. So people went to rush and put all their data into these Hadoop systems with the idea of having MapReduce as a single compute framework and HDFS as a single storage layer. As time went on, however, we started seeing this data ecosystem 1.0 come up. So for end users and data scientists, they realized that MapReduce wasn't the, the only solution, in fact, wasn't the best compute framework to be able to solve their data challenges. They started experimenting with different frameworks like Spark, uh, right, memory computing, and Presto for interactive SQL workloads. At the same time, embracing different map machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow and FA. Uh, they also realized that from a storage perspective, HDFS was becoming increasingly complex and expensive to, to buy. Um, and they started looking at lower cost alternative, alternative storage solutions, especially around object storage, whether that was in the cloud with things like S3 or Blob, or on premises with you know, IBM Clever Suites. Um, so this, what we start seeing in, 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 the, in the ecosystem is this data site going in these innovation paths. So first it started going from this co-located uh, computer and HDFS living on the same cluster where what we saw was typically these clusters would increasingly become compute bound and over 100% capacity. Uh, furthermore, we need, they realized that compute and IO needed to be scaled together even when it wasn't necessary to do so because they were co-located in this manner. So then they went ahead and disaggregated this and had this, uh, different nodes for the compute and HDFS while still in the same cluster. And so what this allowed them to do was they were able to scale compute and um, IO independently but IO still needed to be uh, maintained on HDFS, and that turned out to be quite expensive. Uh, at the same time, they started needing to be able to support more, a plethora of more frameworks. They needed to support Presto, Spark, and they needed to be do, able to do this across data centers without these multiple application changes being done. Uh, one of the biggest trends we see now is this enable, enablement of hybrid cloud. So with the advent of cloud, people realized that they can now burst compute analytics to the cloud and indeed with things like Kubernetes, they were able to do this seamlessly burst up and scale up and scale down uh, on demand. Uh, and so they need you to be able to do this both public and private cloud and using sometimes on-premise data. And so finally transition to object storage, uh, they need to be able to enable and accelerate machine learning analytics on these object storage as well. So that's where we saw Alexio come in. Alexio essentially is a data orchestration layer for the cloud. With Alexio, you now have the ability to scale compute and storage independently of each other. 
And so from the application perspective, what you can see is that your applications today could continue leveraging the interface types that they're most accustomed to. So if it's a big data uh, Hadoop application, uh, Alexa exposes itself at, in a familiar HDFS type interface. Uh, for newer machine learning models like TensorFlow or Cafe, uh, Alexa could expose itself with a POSIX-like interface. Um, and then on the SatGround side, which we call the storage uh, drivers, Alexa could then speak transparently to the storage device regardless of where that data is sitting. So whether it's HDFS, uh, if it's some object store on-prem or in the cloud, or even more some legacy appliances if they still use an NFS inter interface. Uh, one of the key things that we want to do at Alexa is be able to have these flexible APIs to have minimal code changes required for your applications to be able to work with Alexio. So we, Alexio has flexible APIs to interact with data in Alexio regardless of what application is speaking to it. So if you see here, if you, you, know, if you have Spark, uh, you know, Alexa could be taken in as traditional RDDs that Spark's accustomed to be able to work with. Uh, Presto, we can you know, uh, have the file location specified as an external table for the Alexa main uh, space. And then things like Posits and Java, we can have traditional open file operations on the files in the Alexa main space. The Alexio reference architecture looks a little something like this. So for those of you familiar with HDFS, it's a very similar master worker architecture. Uh, so we have the applications in this case, uh, Presto and Spark running, and they have a reference to the Alexio client, which is essentially just a jar file that we have. Um, and so the Alexio client mm -hmm. is then able to communicate to the master, and the master is the one that has uh, kind of notice and reference of where the metadata is and the files are across its multiple workers. And the workers are the ones that could do the data transfers and go out into these different underscore devices and bring data back into the Alexio main space. Um, Alexio is built in with high availability, so if you have uh, Zookeeper already in your environment, we could plug into that. Uh, with our latest release, we actually have an internal graph election algorithm that we use, so we could say a little bit to a standby master using that. Uh, and one thing to note is the Alexio worker could manage uh, storage across three tiers of storage, whether that's memory, SSD, or HDD. Uh, one thing we realize is sometimes memory be, could be quite expensive and not many applications have much memory to get up uh, to begin with, but Alexia could manage uh, storage across those three tiers with SSDs and HDDs as a lower cost alternative. Uh, so Kubernetes overview. So Kubernetes is fast becoming kind of very popular container orchestration platform. Uh, it kind of allows, uh, enables containers to be 2.0 level. Uh, so besides just abstracting away physical infrastructure, Kubernetes has things that allow you to do service discovery. Uh, this makes it very easy for client applications to discover endpoints or the applications it needs to connect to. Uh, Self-healing means that as containers go down, they can be spun back up. Uh, you still maintain that state. Uh, you can have secret keys and access keys managed through their secret management. And storage management allows uh, uh, Kubernetes to actually uh, do some of this resource allocation and storage management for you as you kind of spin up these containers. Uh, so some key concepts that we're going to be talking about today is, uh, so containers, these are the actual OS or application binaries that will be running on Kubernetes. Uh, so the Alexia master and the workers are going to be running in separate containers on separate hosts. Uh, pods are the actual scheduled unit of work for these different containers. So we're going to be kicking off a couple of pods for Spark drivers and executors when we start doing the demo. Uh, controllers maintain the state of the pod and persistent volumes or storage provisioned, typically by like a KH admin that uh, has a lifecycle independent of the pod. We use the persistent volume uh, here to actually maintain the Alexia embedded journal. So uh, the embedded journal takes care of any metadata changes to Alexio, and it's what the standby master will pick up on if the primary master fails. So let's go on to the next cool. So, so we talked about this idea of elastic compute that became possible with things like hybrid cloud and Kubernetes, but one of the challenges with that people are still seeing is this idea of elastic data is still not possible with things uh, in, the, in the cloud. So the idea of elastic data with elastic compute built in with tight locality really just means being able to bring cache data close to where the compute is happening. Um, so from big data analytics and machine learning workloads, what we've seen is that a lot of these jobs tend to be uh, very iterative in nature. <coughs> and so to be able to cache data closely to where the compute is happening uh, 
is very important in terms of performance. And we need to also be able to enable high-speed data sharing across <coughs> certain jobs as well. So if a Spark job and is, is co-locating and sharing data with things like Presto, uh, we need to be able to have a caching layer that, that Presto could read from once a Spark job completes. Um, so basically a closer staging storage layer for some of these compute jobs. Uh, and then finally, we need to be able to have a unification of this different persistent storage. And so when I talk about persistent storage, in this case, I'm referring to the understorage, whether that's HDFS, S3, or whatever the object storage is. But we still need to have a data abstraction layer that sits next to the compute level for these compute applications to be able to access. So Alexio and Kubernetes, the demo that we have today is we're going to be running a couple different hosts. And the Alexio master is going to be running as a container on uh, one of the primary hosts. Uh, again, we're going to have a persistent volume, which in this case is going to be EDS volume. Uh, this will be for the Alexio journal. Uh, and this is where Alexio master would be writing any metadata changes. And then on the separate host, we would also have an Alexio workers um, on the separate uh, hosts. And what this would look like with Spark is that we're actually going to have a Spark <coughs> driver on the same host as the Alexio master and Spark executors across the Alexio workers. So when the Spark job requests a subset of data, the Spark driver is going to communicate to the Alexia master. The Alexia master will then tell the Spark driver among which one of its different hosts that data, among which one of the different Alexia workers that data is actually sitting on. And that Spark driver could then go ahead and tell the Spark executors on their respective hosts to be able to schedule jobs co-located local to that host. Um, so, uh, to deploy and provision Alexio, I've done some of this already and we have different time. So uh, provision the persistence volume for the journal. Uh, we can specify the configuration uh, with the config map property. Uh, I'm just using the uh, Kubernetes command line tool here. Um, so I specified the configuration using config map. I went ahead and created and deployed the master and deployed the Alexio workers. So now I can actually get to the demo. All right, so just to give you a little bit of overview of what this environment looks like, so this is actually running across four nodes on EC2 instances, um, M4 2x largest, uh, Kubernetes version is 1.15. Um, my Kubernetes cluster is running in US East 1, and the S3 bucket that I'm connecting through via Luxio is also in US East 1 as well. I went ahead and prepped the UI <coughs> access, so you can see uh, on the Kubernetes UI, I have the Alexio Worker and the Alexio Masters all running as pods. I also, okay, so, so I, I went ahead and installed Alexio, and if I go into my EC2 instance here and do uh, get pods, I can see that my Alexio Master is running along with the Alexio Workers. And so now I'm going to go ahead and I also mount the Alexio S3 bucket. Now if I actually go ahead and look at the Alexia UI, so this is uh, the Alexia UI, it shows us that we have uh, 40 gigs of memory. So what I've done is allocate 10 gigs across each one of the Alexia workers. Uh, so I have 40 gigs total. Uh, again, we see from a storage alias perspective right here that I only have one tier, which is memory right now, but this could be, uh, you could allocate multiple other tiers, whether that's SSD or HDD. Um, if I go ahead and look at browse, I can see I have two directories mounted. And this S3A is actually my S3 bucket that I've mounted. And what we see here in the UI is that I have three files, and the Spark job I'm running, just to give you guys a heads up, is a word count on this sample 2G. Uh, so here we see that the persistent state is persisted, which means that right now this data is currently persisted in the S3 file location. But what we see here in the in Alexia percentage is that this file is not yet in Alexia memory. Uh, so it's only being persisted right now in S3 remotely. So. so I'm going to go ahead and prepare to run Spark. Uh, so 
here I'm just checking to make sure the spheres are found to the spark drivers and executors already created. Uh, in this case, they are. Um, if we go ahead, go into my CD spark directory. And what I'm going to do here is just kick off the spark job, which is doing a simple word count on that directory through the Alexia name path. And you can see that's Alexia because right here we specify the Alexia name path. So it's just uh, to the application, it just uh, is referencing Alexio, but the behind the scenes, this could actually be an S3 bucket, an HDFS file location, or on premise store. So that's running right now. And so while that runs, And I'm just, uh, this, the Spark driver is currently running right now, and I just want to see if the Spark job completed. Uh, okay, so that job did complete, and what we see here is that job that took about 20 million lines, uh, it took about 18 seconds uh, to run. And so now what I'm going to do is go ahead and go back and kill that job uh, that it's completed. And what I'm going to do is take a look at the Alexia UI. And now looking at the Alexia UI, you can see that since we only did the Spark job once, that data is now in Alexia memory. Uh, so it's persisted still in S3, but now it's also cached 100% in Alexia memory. Um, and so now when I go ahead and rerun that same job, uh, again, what... Now when I go ahead and rerun that same job again, and uh, that, what that job is going to be doing is now going to be uh, Spark executors are now going to be able to schedule jobs on the Spark workers, but now the Spark uh, the Alexia workers don't need to go out to S3 to retrieve that data. It's already cached in Alexia memory. So. Uh, Sure, why it's saying that, but I'll just. I just killed the pie and reran it. I think that's uh, the issue here. Okay, so now that's running again. So it took 15 seconds the first time around, and now when we rerun it uh, with the data in memory, uh, it completes in about four seconds. 
Um, so this is just a high level overview of kind of uh, some of the things that we could do with having compute and cache local to Spark. Um, you know, a lot of times we see a lot of these uh, enterprise customers, especially now when we're kind of embracing this elastic compute model, one of the things that they have trouble is still being able to have elastic data in that same kind of paradigm. So what we showed today in this demo was that, you know, uh, we could kind of just an overview of what we talked about when we talked about data orchestration. How Alexa basically enables this idea of elastic data for elastic compute, which is already possible today with Kubernetes. Uh, basically, being able to bring data locality on demand, being able to abstract data and unifying it, and data sharing between multiple different applications. Uh, there's a guide on how to run Alexa with Kubernetes, and I'll make this deck uh, available to you guys after this uh, presentation. And then a demo, just a high level of how to run Spark on Alexa with Kubernetes today. Um, and everything I've shown you today is all uh, part of the open source feature. So if you guys want to uh, you know, look at Alexa.io, you can download Alexa today and start playing around with it. Um, the only thing that's not in the uh, open source that's in enterprise is things around security. So uh, TLS, Kerberos, LDAP authentication, it's all part of the uh, security feature. But so I think that's all I have. Um, if there's any questions, yeah. A um, couple questions. Is the file, uh, once it's caching memory, is, is the file size constrained by the amount of memory that I was going to turn multiple or is that across the board? Uh, so we'll just read it across workers. So yeah, so files, uh, a file, multiple blocks of the same file could be split up amongst workers. And we do that so you can have more of a distributed kind of access mm -hmm. when you have jobs running. So if you want multiple Spark executives to be reading from multiple Alexia workers. So if you're 40 gigabyte, I have there files. Yeah, it's, it's configurable too. So we can set the default block size. So if you want to have small block size, the large block size, you can do that. Okay. Is that the Alexa takes the um, So yeah, so um, it does. I mean, we in the environment. Along with the caching part. Right, yeah. So it is a data orchestration layer similar to how your own schedules things. But uh, Alexa could work in the environment. So if you have Hadoop environment where you have Lux here deployed, you all could do some of that uh, research documentation as well. One more thing. The elastic part is valid only as long as you don't have any code. Like, this is a very simple example. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have new data across nodes, it's not going to solve it. Right? So it will solve only to the extent. So you're saying you mean multiple Lux here workers can be spun up or be able to? No, so let's say you do this. Uh, Yeah, so in, in that case, yeah. So, that, so when we talk about elastic data, we're really referencing that, you know, as data sizes grow larger, we can actually spin up pods on demand. So as data sizes become larger, you can spin up multiple containers that have an Alexia worker and Spark executives kind of built in. And so as data sizes increase, you can have that elastic capability to first spin not possible. So, so data has changed. So depending on the UFS, uh, we handle that differently. So with things like if it's an HDFS uh, underscore where data is being changed dynamically, we actually have something called, uh, we pick up on the Linux I notify API, which is a file system from API that we can use to recognize metadata changes. Um, so we can sync uh, automatically between Luxio and HDFS. Uh, if it's a traditional object store, then we can have uh, parameters built in where you can do sync on demand. So you can set a timer to do a sync uh, if you're aware of when the data is being changed or ahead of time, you can kind of do preload or pre-fetch of the other metadata sync as well. Spark stores data in multiple copies, right? Right, right. What happens in other Yeah, yeah, so you, yeah, yeah, so you could, yep, good question. So you could set replica levels uh, within Alexio, so default, um, you know, if, you're, if you want to know something for like HDFS, you can set the replica level to be three, so that's the default number of replicas that uh, HDFS has. Um, that's just a configuration that you could do uh, within the Luxio. And Alexio actually, uh, once you set the replication level, it does it dynamically, so as the application start reading that same data file, it'll start getting replicated across workers. Uh, 
Um, so I, it was it started off as Tachyon, and then I think uh, they ran into some copywriting issues, so they had to change it to Tachyon. And according to our CEO, it, it, it was I, I think he wanted it to be Luxury IO, so Alexio. <laughs> I, I wasn't there when he made up the name. So. <laughs> 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 <laughs>